I'd like to begin with just asking the question, what do Therese and her little way have to offer us as contemplative women and men who are faced with so many crises in our world today? Um, the environmental uh, disasters, the um, pandemic, of course, the horrors of racial injustice that we're becoming so much more aware of, and then the com almost complete dysfunction of many of our um, institutions. Well, the first thing I want to do is dispel the idea that Therese lived in a world completely different from that. Devout French Catholics of her time experienced themselves as constantly under siege. They felt that their most cherished values and institutions were being uh, desecrated and stripped away. And meanwhile, the political parties of the church supporting monarchists and the anti-clerical secularists were completely unable to compromise with one another. Maybe not so different from what we're experiencing. And then closer to home, Therese's uncle Isidore, who was the fam family patriarch, was a journalist, a very right-wing journalist, who was very busy making fiery commentaries on every issue that came along. So Therese was certainly informed. She was not shielded from the experience of living in a time of profound moral and political crisis. And she was deeply imbued with the cultural symbolism and the patriotic aspirations and the church state politics of her time. She wasn't protected from engagement with the stress and the anxiety of her people. She, like us, was called to live prophetically in stressful and conflictual times. So what does it mean to live prophetically? Well, I think it means living in solidarity with the people of one's own time and place, which are necessarily limited in many ways, while placing one's identity and one's fruitfulness completely in the hands of God. For the biblical tradition, the, the prophet uh, interprets both their own life and the issues of their time through engagement with scripture. So let's turn to the scriptures of this day and see what they reveal to us about Therese as a prophetic figure. Well, one of the first things they revealed to us is how deeply Therese meditated on the word of God and how she let it transform her. The first reading from Isaiah 66 includes one of the lines that directly catalyzed Therese's discovery of her famous little way. She um, found this text when her sister, Celine, came to Carmel and brought a notebook and it included the text, as a mother caresses her child, so I will comfort you. I will carry you on my breast. I will rock you on my knees from Isaiah 66. It also included another line from Proverbs, whoever is a little one, let them come to me. And her meditation on those texts led her ultimately to proclaim, quote, Jesus deigned to show me the road that leads to the divine furnace, and this road is the surrender of the little child who sleeps without fear in its father's arms. So that image of the beloved and trusting infant in the arms of its parent is one of the best known emblems of Therese's spirituality. Of course, it also appears in our gospel for today, where the little child is the one who is most awake to God's wisdom. It's an image that's very deeply embedded in the traditions of French spirituality that shaped Therese. So she didn't just make it up herself. She, she was um, very much imbued with it uh, th uh, through her formation. But she developed it in a way that uniquely captures the combination of grandiosity and humility that is her special genius. An infant is the center of everyone's adoring attention and love, yet an infant is also powerless in so many ways. And Therese, with a kind of grandiosity, 
announced her desire to fulfill every most heroic and most public role in the church. She named warrior, priest, apostle, doctor, martyr, crusader, even papal zouave. But she also discovered the prophetic power of powerlessness. Now this has to be carefully interpreted because of course there are many inauthentic ways to be powerless uh, or to claim powerlessness, just as there are many inauthentic ways to be powerful. And that's where the second reading comes in from 1 John, because whether in power or in powerlessness, the difference between authenticity and inauthenticity is simply the criterion of love. In fact, there really are two faces of Therese's literal way, and each of them is normed by that criterion of love that is so well expressed in 1 John. So the active face of the little way is the daily discipline of love in the small things of life, while the receptive face of the little way is radical self-abandonment into God's love. So looking at the first one of those, Therese, with all her grandiose ambitions, never lost sight of the importance of the smallest acts of love in daily life. People sometimes make fun of her. Um, they regard as petty and childish stories uh, when she talks about being splashed by laundry water or being kind to a grouchy sister who criticized everything she did. But the point is that Therese didn't see loving God as reserved for some special and profound occasions. She had the insight that if God had become incarnate in a small, needy, and unknown human being, then all our small and apparently insignificant encounters are occasions of meeting God. So that's one face of the little way. And we all know that it's profoundly difficult to live that daily discipline of consistently responding with love in the midst of the mundane annoyances of life. And of course, we all fail in that many times every day. But even more challenging is the deeper and more inward face of the little way. Therese's own real spiritual breakthrough came when she realized definitively that it was not her own virtuous actions, but rather her complete letting go and emptiness of self in favor of God's infinite and ineffable action that would finally be transformative for herself and for others far beyond her. That's her discovery of the prophetic power of powerlessness. And it was making this available to so many millions of people that is the really innovative dimension of her spirituality. So maybe one of Therese's most prophetic statements is, quote, Yes, in order that love be fully satisfied, it is necessary that it lower itself and that it lower itself to nothingness and transform this nothingness into fire. The verb uh, to lower itself is active, not because we can lower ourselves to nothingness, but rather because it is God in Jesus who lowers himself to nothingness and God who will also lower us to nothingness in order to transform this nothingness into fire. Another example that uses very different language is the words of Therese's um, defining mystical self-consecration, her oblation to merciful love. And there she wrote, quote, in order to live in one single act of perfect love, I offer myself as a victim of Holocaust to your merciful love, asking you to consume me incessantly 
allowing the waves of infinite tenderness shut up within you to overflow into my soul, and that thus I may become a martyr of your love, O oh my God. The language in the oblation, maybe especially that phrase victim of Holocaust is a little harsh maybe to us or not, or, uh, but we, uh, we must recognize again that this is a phrase uh, very deeply rooted in the traditions of French spirituality and that it is um, fundamentally a Eucharistic uh, image. The image is that of Jesus who gives himself to be completely consumed by love and then um, calls us to give ourselves to be consumed by love. It sounds like, I mean, the language of that oblation sounds as if at that time in her life, Therese was experiencing this self-emptying as a kind of ecstasy, a kind of a joyful delight of waves of infinite tenderness. But later on in the last 18 months of her life, uh, it became for her truly nothingness. Um, she endured a terrible dark night um, in which emptiness was experienced as just that. Um, she felt the emptiness, the ultimate nothingness. But we all know that the fruit of her life has been very far from nothingness. It's been more like an explosion of love rippling through the entire global church. Her faithful and prophetic endurance of being lowered to nothingness has borne fruit indeed in waves of infinite tenderness that have gone forth to millions of people. So it, it, to kind of sum up, how does Therese's little way teach us to live prophetically as contemplative women and men whose identity and fruitfulness are meant to belong ultimately to God. We've seen there's two answers, the two faces of the little way. One is what might seem a little trite, but nonetheless true and essential. Don't neglect the daily little deeds of love. Now for us, that might include, it should include, more direct participation in social justice initiatives that weren't so much directly um, in Therese's uh, view, but it can't allow us to downplay the, dis the daily discipline of the face-to-face, -face, the acts of respect and care of love. The other answer, the other face of the little way, is to open ourselves deeply and contemplatively to the prophetic power of powerlessness. My own favorite image of that um, comes from Therese's last conversations and people who may have read any of my writings know that I always come back to this image. Um, this was an image that came up during that awful final period of, uh, for Therese of physical and spiritual distress. And it's the image of a barely flickering candle hidden away in the sacristy that nevertheless becomes the source of light that fills the whole church. So we are, in fact, flickering candles. We often barely keep alive the flame God has uh, graced us with. But insofar as we let the flame within us become more and more God's, rather than merely our own, we too may participate in the transformation of the world. <laughs>